you are about to hear are the opinions, suggestions, and observations of a licensed real estate broker in California. Since each situation can be unique, do not consider anything said here as legal. Hey, whoa, what are you doing here? Hey. Okay, ooh, whoa, 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 stop the- Oh, 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 Real Estate Realities with the Rebel Broker and now your Rebel Broker Robert Whitelaw Hello everyone Well here it is, it's that time of year again October, the very end of the month is creeping in It's that time for scary stuff and I thought there could be no better time to share some horror stories of real estate than during this time of the year. And now for this first story, we're going to have to go back a few years. Back to the late 80s, early 90s. Night much like tonight. And I've got a few people looking to, to buy a home. It's just a nice couple who want to find a house to live in. And we come to this first house looks like a great deal this is uh, I'm really new in the business at this point this is probably my first year so it's probably 80 1989 and we go ahead and we walk into the house and the first floor looks great everything's the way it should be and we can sort of hear this low-level buzzing sound it sounds almost like one of those th a leaf blower or something like that so we're figuring someone's doing some work outside we like the kitchen we like the living room so we decide to go up and take a look at the bedrooms so I'm leading the way up the stairs for my clients, and the buzzing sound, the vibrating sound, gets more intense. But it doesn't just get louder. It becomes a sound that you can suddenly feel. You can feel your feet and vibrating. You can feel the vibrating in the walls when you touch your hands to them. We get to the top of the stairs, and I start to detect just the hint of, of a sweet smell. We're up there looking at a couple of rooms, and I, my attention gets drawn to the one closed door in the hallway on the second floor. And I slowly walk up to it, put my hand to the door, and it, the, it's amazing the door is still on its hinges. It's vibrating so much. The sound at this point is loud enough that you have to raise your voice to be heard just across the room. So I, being young and stupid, I just throw open the door to show them the master bedroom. And there is a beehive in the upper corner hanging from the ceiling. It must have been three or four feet from top to bottom, maybe two and a half feet wide. And there is just a black cloud mass of bees just swirling around in this room. Um, at which point I scream like a little girl and tell my clients to get out of the house. We run down the house as fast as we can, bees buzzing all around us. We close the front door behind us. Luckily, we didn't get stung. None of them got after us. We just take a moment to catch our breath. And, and I just say to them, I think the next one will be much better. Now, that was, uh, that was probably my first scary moment in real estate. There have been a lot of scary moments that range from just stories like that where something strange happens while you're showing the house to technical scary stuff. Let's go ahead and talk about one of those next. I've had uh, I've had quite a few escrows get a little crazy uh, between the time you open them and the time they finally are supposed to close. I think the worst part for anyone is when it's completely and totally out of your control. Uh, I know that's, that's a common thing for clients. You have to put a lot of trust in your agent and believe that person's going to do for you what they say they're going to do and what they should do. And as an agent, I tend to be more of a, I think folks who, who tend to be better at this job tend to be control freaks. And I, and I know I fall into that category of being a control freak anyway. And the, the parts of the escrow that are most difficult for me are the ones where I have to hand out over complete control to someone else. So since I'm that kind of personality that likes to control things, um, what I will often do is have backup plans in case someone else drops the ball, which has saved my butt more than once. Um, I think the worst ever example though was a case where someone was buying a home 
this would be over in uh, Santa Cruz County in the late 90s, excuse me, uh, yeah, late 90s, well, probably 2000, 2001. And they were insisting on using um, a, a loan organization that I knew from previous experience that had problems getting loans through on properties in the development where we were buying. So I kept suggesting that they look at their options, make double sure they, they didn't want to go with, I gave them two or three folks that I knew could do loans effectively where we were looking to buy and they chose their own person primarily I think because they were related to uh, someone involved in the transaction over at that institution and this is a nationally known bank so it's, it wasn't like they were picking some you know Uncle Bubba's loan department somewhere it was uh, you know a, a major financial institution but it all, in the back of my mind, it was a little scary, so I, I insisted that as a backup plan that they fill out the paperwork with another place where I happen to have a very good relationship with them and said, listen, they're going to go with this other person, but please, as a favor to me, let's just do the paperwork so that you're ready to go at a moment's notice. So we're going down through the escrow, time's ticking down, and every step of the way I'm calling these other loan folks and making sure everything's fine. Every time I call, the story is it's great, everything's fine, paperwork's going to go through. Week after week, day after day, that's the same answer I get every time I ask. Well, here we are. It's time for the loan to fund. We are in the week where it is supposed to fund. And the paperwork goes to whatever final review person does that sort of thing. And the word comes down, they won't do the loan. We're three days away from closing on this escrow. And after all of this time, after all the reassurances, they tell us that they're not going to fund the loan. So on the downside, we, we had a major freak out, major bad problem. On the upside, thank God they'd filled out that paperwork because the time between, um, they had actually gone to the trouble of doing everything for me. So the time between us switching gears and going with this other company literally only cost us seven days, which is unheard of. It's miraculous. So scary story with a happy ending. And now here's one as, for me as a buyer. Um, this would be when I was looking at properties in Texas. This would be about 1989, 90. No, excuse me, 1999, 19, uh, 2000. And I'm looking at these homes. These are townhomes and condominiums that are in an area around Austin near some tennis park things uh, that, are, that tend to be popular, that tend to rent seasonally very well. And we're looking through these homes. And I'm downstairs. And uh, just checking out the, the storage in the, in the unit. And I open up one of the closets. And there, what's left of a, a dead cat uh, this cat had obviously been there a very long time. It was it was uh, pretty much all dried up. Its bones were showing in the chest. And I'm oh my god, this is terrible. I make sure and tell the folks who are listing the house that this this is here and they should take care of it with my cell phone, so I can continue look. I continue looking at the property. I go upstairs, and in another closet, I find. I'm not sure what it is small enough to be either a very big rat or a big hamster or some other kind of it looks like it's a pet but it's locked in this closet and it's dead call up the listing agent let them know that this is there starting to wonder about this place keep looking around go into the garage and find another dead body this time a dog uh, that looks like it had been there a lot longer than the others and I decide that uh, someone's trying to give me a sign that maybe this isn't the property for me. You know, sometimes a good story it really depends on how you, how you, how you end it, how, you, how it ends up. And, you know, don't you always wish that when you're in those situations that whatever the really witty thing just pops into your head right there at that moment? Now, every once in a while I get lucky and it'll... it'll Something will come to mind and it fits perfectly and and it makes a bad situation good or at least takes the weight off of a, of a, a difficult situation. But uh, in one case, and I thought I pulled it off fairly well when it all came to a head, but I was showing a property to, to a couple. Now the folks are looking for 
your standard starter home. They're in a community where ranch styles are real common, your typical suburban neighborhood. And the folks who are selling the house are like a lot of folks. Their children have all moved out of the house, and they're looking just to kind of get out. Um, and they're still in the process of getting the home ready. This is back when the market was a little bit hopping, so, so ten, homes tend to go quickly. And they were in the process of, the sellers were in the process of moving some random things out of the house. Uh, called ahead, made an appointment, pulled up with my clients, and the sellers were just leaving. They were just packing a few things into their Jeep, and they were saying, oh, we're sorry, we're still here. We just have a few things. We're gonna, a couple things we're going to take the dump, a couple things we're going to take to Goodwill. I said, great, no problem. We'll be happy just to, if it's all right with you, we'll just look around the house. So we start our little look. We, we start in the kitchen, and everything looks wonderful. We start, then we work into the master bedroom, the other bedrooms. And uh, the husband asks about how big the garage is. I say, well, you know, it, it looked like a pretty good size from the outside. Uh, he's into woodworking or has, likes to have a workshop, so he's wondering how good it'll be. And, and I'd actually seen the property before. And I said, you know, I think the depth of, of that is probably pretty good. The downsize is, is that these sellers have converted it. Oh, well, that's a, that's a shame, he says, you know, because we really don't want to have to go to the trouble of converting something from what it is back to what it should have been. I say, well, let's go take a look and see how involved it looks like it'll be. So we walked through the kitchen and, and walked to the, it, the door had been opened up a little bit, so now it was double doors instead of a single door leading into the garage. We open up the double doors, and we look inside. It's been converted into a relatively nice room. It's got a foosball table. There's a couch. It looks very deep for a garage, so yeah, it would work if it had still been a garage. But they've built um, a regular wall where the garage door is, so it's not just a garage. It's, all, it's, a, it's completely finished, carpeted the whole nine yards. I said, well, it's really a shame that, that this happened. You know, it's too bad that they did that. But, you know, it probably wouldn't take too much to bring it back to just being a place where you can park your car. Right about when I said that, the Jeep that the sellers were driving comes barreling through what used to be the garage door right into their converted garage and stops right there in the center after ramming into the foosball table and making it fly against the back wall. <clears throat> they, uh... Apparently lost control. They were, they had put in reverse when they went to go in for. They were, but however they did it, they did it, and the car was now parked in front of us. And um, I just turned to my client and said, "Well, it's a garage again." So I'm hoping that someone out there's laughing because there's nothing on this end. For me, it's I'm just in an empty room, so I'm hoping that went over with somebody. But um, luckily, nobody was hurt. It was you know the, the the first instinct was jump in there and make sure everyone's all right. They were fine. Um, luckily, they hadn't done a substantial build job on that garage door. It was it was just a few. It was two by fours with some drywall nailed to it, and then finished off. But um, I always thought that was really. I thought I pulled that one out of the hat as far as being pulling out something witty to say in the moment. Um, the sellers, of course, were were a little embarrassed. They uh, had inadvertently they had backed into their driveway. And out of habit, the husband dropped it into reverse instead of drive, and he just plowed right back into his garage. Now, here's one. And this was uh, the first one that popped into my head that made me think doing maybe just a horror stories show would be a good one. Now, as you might well guess, as a real estate person, I spend a lot of time in a lot of different houses. Um, I meet a lot of different types of people that range from the obnoxiously sane all the way to the uh, reassuringly insane and living where I live and here in California there are always stories um, you know I've and we've had I've listed homes where a seller would, would ask me you know do we need to um, do we need to do a disclosure if someone has died in the house or do we need to disclose if the house is haunted you know, that's not normal stuff. It's, I, I've never actually had anyone um, ask me about disclosures uh, if someone's been murdered in their house. But, I, but you know, we, there have been places where someone has died there. I had one client who firmly believed their home was haunted. And this, uh, and I do have one story that's perfect for this time of year that relates to an, an older house in Palo Alto. Now, this wasn't a home I had a listing on. This was something, this was a house that I was... Uh, kind of peripherally involved with. A friend of mine had the listing and there were some clients that wanted to see it and I, and I couldn't I couldn't take them. I was out of town during the time so I had a friend of mine from the office go and show them this house and so I wanted to check back in 
after I got back, I checked in with my clients. I said, oh, it was great. It was really nice. We had a good chance to talk to one of the owners and ask a lot of questions about the house, and it sounded really great. Uh, so we're, we're actually thinking there might be a possibility of us making an offer on the house. I said, great, fantastic. So I wanted to go talk to my agent who helped me out uh, by showing it to these folks and get some feedback from him and uh, ask him ab about uh, what other information that we might have that we could provide for these buyers. And so I talked to him for a minute and he said, yeah, well, you know, I, I, I sort of just opened the door, door for him. I was doing business on the phone. Um, but I, and he said, I guess one of the owners was there because um, they told me when they came out, they'd talked to the wife. For, for about uh, about 20 minutes in there about different things relating to the house. He said, which which to me was strange because the house is supposed to be vacant. It was it had been uh, vacated about about three months before that. So there was no one in the house living. Uh, there was no one living in the house. So I said, okay, great. So I, I went and talked to the person who held the listing on the house and uh, told him that I had some clients that were very interested. And I said, you know, they spent some time talking to the wife about the home and they, they liked what they heard. We just wanted to get the rest of the information you had if you had any other disclosures. And the agent doesn't respond. He's very quiet on the other end. He says, you, t you, you talk to the owner? And I, and I said, yeah. Well, I didn't talk to the owner. I said, the clients talk to the owner. He says, huh, well, the, the owner um, has moved away. The, the owner is actually back on the East Coast and um, they haven't been in the house in since, since before we listed it. I said, well, you know, there was a woman in there, and she spent some time talking to him, and, and they are under the impression that she was one of the owners. And he said, well, you know, there, there's only one owner. It, the reason why it's going up for sale is, is there were too many bad memories in there for the husband. His wife died last year, and uh, so there's the only person who owns it is the husband. And that was one of those moments. That was one of those wow moments, and... Um, my understanding is that they did, when we asked them when I asked her them to describe the woman and I and I sent it off to the listing agent. He said, "Yeah, that's that's a description of the wife. That's a description of, of the man's wife." So there's one of those little uh, little ghost stories you could you could pass around to the folks at work. That that one always kind of freaked me out. I've never had a direct one myself uh, working in real estate. I've had a few weird things happen in my life, but nothing I'd call ghost story type stuff. But those stories are out there. Now, there's one more. And the reason I saved this one for last is because, in a, it, because for me, it really has the most credibility. Because the person who relayed this story to me, it happened to them firsthand. And this was the most sober guy you'd ever want to meet. Totally a straight shooter. Um, an ex-Navy guy that, that went into real estate and... A, a really good friend of mine from early on when I got into the business. And back then I was doing business in an area called Los Altos, Los Altos Hills, um, which is which is a you know in the Palo Alto area, which has some older homes, newer homes, but also tends to be more high priced homes. And he was looking at properties by previewing them. He wasn't he, so he didn't have clients with them. He was just going to look at homes to see if they'd fit with any of the buyers that he currently was working with. So. He goes up to this house. It's just after sundown. Um, he was actually still in the Navy at this point, so he he was working almost a normal nine to five schedule with the Navy. But he'd go out after work and do the things he could, uh, and then he could get away at some strange times when he needed to. But anyway, the point being, it was it was dark, um, and he was going to see a house that was listed as vacant. And he pulls up to the house, and he's one of these guys that starts on the outside. So he starts, he's got his little flashlight, he's walking around the outside of the property, just checking out the, the side yards, the backyard, and he hears uh, what sounds like a party going on inside of the house. And when he gets around to the back of the home, he can see lights on, on the second floor. You know, oh wow, okay, well maybe it's, maybe it's not vacant. Um, or maybe the, the folks were just back for a while to, to do something. So he can he distinctly hears music. He just he hears the sounds of people talking. Uh, lights are on. Goes around to the front of the house. Gets the key from the lockbox. Opens up that front door. And it's one of those weird tri-level homes where if you enter from the front, you're actually on the second floor of the home. And from the back of the home, if you entered through the ground floor door, you'd be on the bot the the floor below where you'd enter if you were in the front. It's, it's so it's on a hill. 
Anyway, so he opens that door expecting to see the party because on, now he's on what was the second floor when he was behind the house. He throws the, this beautiful, gigantic door wide open, and it's a house that has almost no furnishings in it. It's completely black, dark. Everything's turned off, and nobody there, not a soul. Uh, no sounds, no music, no talking. And he goes to turn on the lights, and they won't turn on. The power's off. Uh, it had been off for two weeks. They had taken out the appliances and everything else uh, previously and just went ahead and decided to turn off the electrical power. That story gets me every time, Just and primarily it's because of the guy who told me the story. Um, and he said it really freaked him out. And, that, and he said that was also the last time he ever went to preview properties after dark. He, he was done with previewing properties after dark from then on. Um, so I hope those help you sleep a little bit more soundly this evening. I appreciate you indulging me this week and just sitting back and telling you a few stories that I thought might be nice for this Halloween season. Not always good to be focused so seriously every week. If you folks have any comments, ideas, or suggestions on future shows, you want to ask me any questions, or you just want to pick my brain about real estate, feel free to get in touch. The first way is always the easiest way, which is email, and that's robert at soldbyrobert.com. If you'd like to visit my website and maybe read something a little bit more serious about real estate, you can visit me at www.soldbyrobert.com. If you'd like to give me a phone call, you can always do that. The phone number is 408-852-0525. Thanks a lot. Happy Halloween. I hope you guys have a great time out there trick-or-treating.